Welcome to Going Deeper. I'm Marcy Sklove, and I am sitting with Ani Tuzman. We're in our second part of our interview. Welcome back, Thank Ani. you, Marcy. Yeah, and uh, Ani has written this amazing novel, which we will show you in more detail, called The Tremble of Love. And it is a novel, it's fiction, about this really incredible mystic called Baal Shem Tov. And I, I want to, you know, we're, I want to hear, we have the whole half hour to talk about the book and different aspects. So I'd like to start with how, how did it come to be that you wrote about the Baal Shem Tov that's my first question. And then I have some questions about these characters who are so alive. Mm. And what is that? I haven't ever written something like, I mean, this is a big novel and I've never writ written something like that, but how do you contain all of them and where do they live? And oh, all of those, questions. I, the <laughs> image I have of like them being on your, you know, maybe this tall on your desk no. <laughs> okay. So start with the first one. Like yes. How, yeah. how did this start? So it started long before the writing started. Okay. So, and there's a connection to our, our first part of our interview. Yeah. But again, in broader, simpler strokes, I, my parents, as I had said before, were, were survivors of the Holocaust. And along the way, and I... I went as a child after experiences of a great deal of discrimination and even abuse in a public school as the only Jew, my parents put me in a yeshiva for a few years. Hmm. And in, which is, uh, for those that might not know, is, is uh, we had Hebrew studies and prayer all morning hmm. and secular studies in the afternoon. We were in school from eight till four. And we studied and I learned there, I heard about this rabbi, the Baal Shem Tov, which means it, it can mean the, the good master of the name or the master of the good name. Oh, it, interesting. It's because of the way Hebrew has modifiers, it can sure. mean that's both. cool. And m my life at home and everything I knew connected to Eastern Europe and my parents' background was shrouded in sorrow and I used to think flowers didn't grow in Poland oh. I as a child oh. I it was so and the sky was always gray mm. and then I find out I hear about this rabbi from that part of the world who danced with joy mm. and who also who saw everybody as equal and equally to be valued and everything I heard about him matched both my own deepest sense of life which I kept pretty secret because mm -hmm. my parents' points of view, understandably, were very different, and they thought to think like that was dangerous. Okay. And, and, and also, it, it just gave me so much joy to think someone like this had existed. So along the way, a book was translated, which I had read so many times that I had it bound with rubber bands. Mm. And it was the only book in English about the Baal Shem Tov, Shivei Habesht, or um, the translation is, um, well, tales, they were legends and tales of, yeah. the, of, of um, the Baal Shem Tov. One day, again, a long story shorter, and mm -hmm. I've written about it on my blog, The Call to Write the Tremble of Love. I just, that book was as if it were pulsating, and mm. I picked it up and began to look, look at it more. This was decades after, yeah. decades later, children later. <laughs> yeah, wow. and, and then shortly thereafter, I experienced an inner call, which felt, it felt like the Baal Shem Tov from within. Yeah. However people choose to interpret such yeah. an experience, it was a call. Mm -hmm. And I've written more. I won't go into the whole detail. I was, I, well, no, the first thing I said was yes. I felt the call. I knew it wasn't um, an historical study. I knew it sure. was a novel. And I said, yes. And then I said, oh, but 
they're more famous people, but, and this inner dialogue ensued, um, which was profound. One, and this ties to the first, I will just say, our first section was, I was given the reasons why it was yeah. me. And one of them was um, that I need, well, I, it's, I'm reluctant to say it sounds unhumble, but what I heard was I need a mystic. And what I knew right away mm -hmm. was that it was connected to my love of nature, mm. which he yeah. Im immersed himself in nature. And I heard other things. I need someone who knows what it is to have a living master. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I had no idea how this would happen. I thought it was, I argued for a somebody more known on yeah. the literary scene sure. if this was to come forth but the the discussion was done and a while later i realized in the i think it's in the torah where it says not a seven ishma the jewish people are it's a description we'll do it now explain oh. and i realized that my yes was all my instant yes yeah. no clueless as to how yeah. and and later arguing was a na seven ishma of course i'll do it yeah now you know, and let me explain why I might not be the best choice. Sure, but sure. But what a gift. Oh my gosh, what, what a gift a to gift. you, what a gift to the world. This book is so amazingly, mm -hmm. yeah. I also, I, I just want to quickly make reference. I did an uh, interview with Penny Gill. Do you know Penny yes. Gill? Yes. Who uh, channels Manjushri. And, um, it, it's great to suggest, like, however anyone wants to interpret this, which I totally love, the openness and, ex, you know, sort of acceptance of however it gets understood. But I also am very much uh, aware of what that looks like, that sense of being connected to someone from a, another time, yes. uh, just a kind of energy that speaks there's some mysterious way that you know you're having a conversation, but right. there are no words. Right. All right. of that right. is really, I, I'm very, I feel close to that. And so. I, just to say, I did not talk about that. The book took over 20 years to research and write with yeah. life, many life events stopping me. Yeah. And I did not tell that story. I, I, sure. And then I was moved one day, it was time. It, sure. it was time to share yeah. it. So. So, okay. So let's get to the, the characters, characters. <laughs> because how does that how does that yeah, so, happen? So I did a lot of research because I needed to know the period. I sure. needed to know everything I could learn. The Baal Shem Tov did not write books, and um, nothing was written in his lifetime. So I had all these legends, and once I had a sense of the, and I needed to know about Eastern Europe, and I needed to know, I needed to know so much. You know, when someone rests her hands, what's the cloth? What's wow, the floor sure. of, is it, is it packed dirt? Is it, so it, everything. And at the time, Wikipedia, you know, all that didn't exist. <laughs> oh no. I, I had, I have, a, I wrote of it. I had about a hundred, I remember counting, I had 111, I think, books out of the UMass oh. Tower Library to get all these pieces. Mm -hmm. In any case, once I had a sense of the place, I started to, I already had been taking long walks, yeah. long walks, hours and hours in, in the woods. And I began to walk with various incarnations of tape recorders oh, okay. over the years. So yeah. Walkmans and on up yeah. to iPhone apps. And I would record what I saw. And I would then go home and transcribe and write. <clears throat> Let me back up for a minute. While I was doing research, I would feel there's a scene here or there's a, hmm. so I would have some ideas and there is a story of the Baal Shem Tov legend. There sure. is, so I knew a trajectory mm -hmm. that I would follow. But then I began to, like the herbalist we see in the first chapter. Yeah. I just, I, what I would do is, I knew he knew, who taught him? Yeah. Who taught him to read, who taught him, and some of it, it's a blend of invention mm -hmm. and intuition or seeing, and there would be times where 
For example, somebody would approach to ask a profound question, like if you're such a great healer, this is much later in the book, and I promise no spoilers, um, someone would say, how come you couldn't heal so-and-so? Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't know, I would wait for the answer just like whomever had asked him would wait. And I would walk and walk sometimes for two or three hours with the, and then feel him about to answer, turn on the tape recorder and receive the answer. Oh my. I don't know that I've ever said this before in this way, <laughs> as direct, really said what went on. And this would happen again and again. Th then other times I would be walking and creating the scene. Mm -hmm. And, but for example, once I was walking and I knew this was the last time two people would be seeing each other. I didn't know right away which one of them, because one of them would die. I didn't know which one would die. Oh and then I, then I apprehended. And I stopped the tape recorder. I'd been writing the scene. I saw one embrace. I saw them embrace. I saw who was going to die. I didn't know yet just how it would unfold. And I, I cried. I, I grieved for her. I did later again as I wrote the scene, but this would keep happening. Yeah. So what an amazing experience. And sometimes it would be when I was transcribing that things would come. I literally felt <laughs> that I spent a lot of the time kind of with this and opening at the crown of my head yeah. and, and things would just, and I needed to do whatever I needed to do to, yeah. to be out of the way. But I was yeah. also the instrument, so sure. it's very hard to describe. I read the book over and over, and it's still new to me. Yeah. And yet I can remember crafting scenes, and yet it's both. So yeah. it's, it's, it's hard That's to describe. Incredible. Because there's also a skillfulness of, you know, that this has to make sense. So you're having all of Absolutely. this kind of intuition and all of the different aspects of the kind of the mystical piece, but there has to be sort of a linear progression the, and people have to make sense when they come and go. Right. And, and related to that, yeah. my, I have a service here to my readers. Yeah. So I need, a, I, I have to have a story and a storyline that makes them want to turn pages. And makes sense. Because yeah. if not, now, um, again, I probably said this along the way, I, there were 850 pages at some point. Oh my gosh. And so there, um, in fact, I thought, recently I thought, hmm, it might be interesting to share some of what was taken out yeah. some point. And now there's about 500. I'm and, looking to see. Yeah, yeah. without the uh, glossaries and right. et cetera. Right, 518, I think. Eight, yeah. yeah. Um, and so, um, hmm. I, that's an important, important service to respect to my readers, yeah. that it has to cohere, it has to be a story, but um, not just a plot-driven story. No, I no, had no. one editor who wanted me to take out all sorts of scenes that I sort of call them the vertical, yeah. the, the deeply going inside meditative scene, oh. and and sort of to move the move it faster. Oh, move it. I see. And I some I did, but um, there would be no book for me without right, those. Right, so, right, right. Yeah, I, this is all totally resonating because, as you know, my husband is writing this book, and it also has some elements of being channeled and has some of those same problems that you're talking about with, you know, the struggle between the publisher or the editor and you and your, you know, and all the characters and what they want to say about <laughs> right. it. <laughs> right. Um, okay, so why don't we hear a couple of, you know, examples, short examples from the book um, well, that what might I, help us know, like, what were some of the... the what I, I have a few very short, they're just, they're quotes, yeah. um, or excerpts, you know, from, let's see, and, uh, and can share that. Um, and these I've made into graphics and... Um, 
will be showing them. We'll be doing, them. and I'll be, I'll be sharing some of them. Yeah, on your website, but also yeah. we'll show wonderful. them. That's in wonderful. That's wonderful. In the show. So, so here's one that, that again, for those that have seen the, our first mm -hmm. um, part one, part of part one, uh, this uh, connects my own life experience. And mm -hmm. so this is the Baal Shem Tov speaking, and, and that's enough to know. Um, he's, I'll just say he's been questioned about how he can, in the face of, of some very difficult situations and abuses of power, how he can continue and, um, and have faith and joy. And he says, I faced the human capacity for cruelty and destruction. At the same time, I experienced the inherent desire of life to endure and flourish. Perhaps this is what a soul is, a spark of pure impulse to live and thrive. Nonetheless, we have to choose again and again. A man can close his eyes and only perceive darkness. A woman can close her heart and only know hatred and terror. Or we can choose to focus on the light and increase it. This choice is at the heart of being human. Mm. And it connects also with that story you told in part one about this little girl who was a bully in your school and even though she was so awful to you you saw a spark of light in her so you know it's it's so when i when i hear you read this it's like wow the Baal Shem Tov is so wise and but you wrote it <laughs> so it's like ani is coming through the Baal Shem Tov, the same way the Baal Shem Tov is coming, coming through, through Ani. Amen. That's yeah. so cool. Yeah. Wow. So there is some, uh, a, like a dark part that I wanted to ask you about, because I'm sure this is historical, and it really bummed me out, <laughs> which was this Shabtai Tzvi. Mm -hmm. False Messiah, Shabtai right. Tzvi. And they were so awful. So what, they were Jewish? <laughs> what, who, how, who are they? <laughs> it was a big movement. I, I won't give a history lesson, but no. um, but it, you know everything also in its context. And dare I say, we're facing some things in our time now, and one wonders how can people follow yeah. flawed leaders? Um, so there had been massacres. Huge, mm -hmm. I never can say the name right. The narrator of the audiobook, who's Polish born, says it beautifully, but Chelmnitsky massacres that happened in Eastern Europe. And t terrible pogroms, terrible devastation. Well, there's a belief about the Messiah coming after the apocalypse. Okay. So this man rises up, Shabtai Tzvi, who we now, again, we didn't have the words, and I explore this in the book. He mm. was probably manic depressive. Uh -huh. but he would have these states of exaltation and despair. But there was a prophet who told him that he was the Messiah. He was the one everyone was waiting for. Yeah. And in his states of mania, yeah. and I guess the legend is, or not legend, I think it, there's some history. He rode a white horse. Okay. And so people followed him. Now, th this isn't in the time period of the book. Oh, I see. It's preceding the book, but there's someone who does come into the book who is, says he's the reincarnation, Jacob yeah. Frank, of this false That's messiah. Right. That's right. And th all along, as it says, there's a passage where it says that, that um, the embers remained. So even though Shabtai Tzvi winds up converting to save his skin to Islam, and it, every, people are devastated, and I mean, but the following was enormous at the time. Wow. And he was charismatic when he was yeah. in a certain state. So we, that's referenced in the book yeah. because the Sabbatean cells, as they were called, yeah. remained and went underground. Okay. And so here we are, um, let's see, Sabbatean was 1660. So here we are, you know, 50, 60 years later, a okay. little more. And then we're seeing 
this the Sabbatean embers being flamed and and also it was a real twisting of, of Kabbalistic teachings right Kabbalistic teachings were coming forward more in the, you know in the, the lineage heritage not lineage but the heritage sure. the Baal Shem Tov is in the lineage of Haari the Oh, okay. Kabbalistic master of Luria, who Luria, yeah. lived in the mm -hmm. in the fifteen hundreds, but um, there was a twisting of what Luria taught, which is that one finds sparks of love and holiness hidden. Right. That's a simplification, sure. but but at works as a simplification, and so the Baal Shem Tov, of course, taught this. Yeah. And and we can find that love everywhere. Right. And we can work within ourselves to find it, to release it with others. But the, the false messiah and, and Jacob Frank, this descendant who, of them. said, oh, let's, we find it in evil. So the long oh. answer to your question is the, uh, the messiah is, all, you know, the end of the world is only going to come when we've completely turned this reality upside down. Oh my so gosh. there's horrible immorality, horror yeah. sexuality, sending one's daughters out to be prostitutes in the streets, all sorts of craziness, yeah. crazy revelry uh, in the name of Kabbalah and in the name of bringing, you know, the end of time sooner. And there were people who were willing in their sorrow, in their desperation, in their longing for the end times and the Messiah. Yeah to believe. And the Baal Shem Tov, as you see in the book, is accused by some of being a Sabbatean. Right. How dare you dance with the Torah and the sit, how, what's all this ecstasy? And so oh it's a gosh. very interesting tension yes. uh, in the right. book. That's right. And what does it really mean to find beauty and love in darkness? And, and what does it mean to live that? And yeah. so that's all and explored. it can be so brought into the modern time absolutely oh my goodness in fact if it's okay there's this yes, is so please. relevant so there's a, a man a rabbi who's come to the Baal Shem Tov deeply concerned about the aberrations that things that are going on and fa and flawed leadership and the Baal Shem Tov responds this is just a little piece and he says to this rabbi I'm not counseling passivity or indifference. I'm counseling you to stand rooted in the truth you wish to protect rather than bent over by fear. I urge you to strengthen your faith while remaining vigilant. How, Rebbe? Instead of focusing on the misuse of power, employ your vigilance to go deeper into yourself to find your true power. And it's amazingly relevant. So relevant. Yeah, I recently uh, heard an audio kind of conversation between Rabbi Ingbar, who taught this Kabbalah class, and this other man whose name I'm not going to remember, and the other man who is kind of a, a, a teacher said, this was right after the election, and he said, we have to up our practice. Period. That's what we have to do. Yeah. We have to work really, yes. really yes, hard. Yes, exactly. And uh, it seems so disjointed for some kinds of people thinking like, no, we have to get in the streets, we have to fight, we have to protest. But this is the same thing, you know. And yes, and the Baal Shem Tov was an activist. It's sure. Not, and the other thing that's fascinating is I said the book took a long time and there were some very major life events that caused me to wait. Yeah. The book finally emerged a month after the election oh in 2016. Gosh. And it blew me away because in my yeah. mind it should have been sooner. I, you know, there were all these. Sure. But when I saw and then I remembered the original call and knowing that, that these teachings, they were a blessing at this time, yes. and there are others that are coming forth. Sure. Penny Gill's work you mentioned, sure. yeah. and this was one of them, and that the timing was, and people, many people read the book on the heels of the election, yeah. and 
were heartened and wrote about that. Uh, and so that was pretty remarkable too because it's uncanny. Right. Here we are back in the it's 1700s, right. how much correspondence yeah. there, there is in the book to our times now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. The gods <laughs> are kind of laughing as they do this play, right? This play of timing. And <laughs> it's amazing. So I, I, we have like a few minutes left, and I just, I kind of wanted to ask you what you'd like to add, I mean, not to totally put you on the spot, but uh -huh. is there something that we haven't yet touched or something about the book or something else that touches you to talk about? Um, just uh, that I hope those who are stirred or called or curious even, will um, receive the gift mm. that comes through the vessel of this book. Mm -hmm. It feels to me like, and I say this with, with gratitude, I can't even, mm -hmm. it's immense. It, it feels this is a book and it's a vessel. Mm -hmm. And we know also that image of the vessel in Kabbalah, yes. which I totally loved hearing yeah. that the vessel must break, mm -hmm. and it's in the repair of the vessel that it gets stronger. Yeah. And the vessel can hold the shards of light yeah. better after it's broken. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I love that image of a vessel, and it is definitely that. Yeah. And so that if it can touch hearts. Um, yeah. And the other thing just to mention is the theme of grief it's certainly not the only, but that is, and, and so just as some people have written me who've lost beloveds mm -hmm. and have talked about how the book has affected their hearts mm. and their experiences of grieving. Yeah. And so to mention that as well. Nice. Sure. And people can get a a good taste on the website of chapter yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. And it's Dance of the Letters. It's uh, or, or it, it, it can be found by Tremble of Love, the yeah. Tremble of Love. Ani Tuzman. It's yeah. AniTuzman.com. Is yeah, but and it can we'll be put found in any number of ways. But there is an audio book sample and a chapter one sample, and they're they're nice tastes. Too. Good, good. Yeah, Ani, thank you so much thank for you, coming. Marcy. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you all for to, you know, watching the show. If you are a local person and want to contribute to Amherst Media to help them support these kinds of, of local community shows, that would be awesome. And for now, I'll say goodbye. Thank you. Well, when I was a little boy on my mama's knee She said, son, let me tell you about that bad staggerly 